thought it might be helpful if I talked about some of the information available on Michael Harding's paint tube labels. There's actually quite a lot of data there if you know what you're looking at. First thing, obviously, is the name given to the paint. So this will vary sometimes from one manufacturer to another. They may use different names to refer to the same pigment, which can get a bit confusing. One of the things I like about Hardings is that they tend to use very straightforward names. If there's a widely used name for a pigment, that's the one he's going to use. So the first large name is in English and underneath you've got the name in German, French and then Italian. You then have number 133, which is the code used by Hardings to refer to this product within their range and the series is number one. The paint series refers to how expensive the pigments are. Pigments simply cost different amounts of money to acquire. Some are much more difficult to process than others so they're bracketed into series according to the cost. Series one being the lowest cost bracket. The really interesting bit is a little bit further down. In the smaller type you get the pigment index number. This one is PB29, you can see it on the side. And that tells you that this pigment is silica of sodium, aluminium and sulphur. You can look up these pigment index numbers on the internet. Some manufacturers choose not to tell you the name of the pigment, they will just give you the pigment index number and you can look them up to find out exactly what they're using inside the paint tubes. It's a really useful way to figure out precisely what you're painting with and how it's going to behave. The last piece of information on the tube is the binder. It says that it's ground in linseed oil. This is the most common binder used for making oil paint, but you may find some paints bound with walnut oil, safflower oil, different oils for different reasons. So now we're going to take a look at the small print on the back of the paint tube label. This is where some of the real nitty gritty is to be found. Firstly, it describes the pigment nature. This is the source of the pigment, if you like. It's the classification of the chemistry of the pigment. So there are two classifications, inorganic and organic, which have nothing to do with compost or food. Um, the inorganic ones are basically your elements, metals, oxides, salts, generally referred to as the minerals. And organic pigments tend to be carbon-based, mostly transparent dye pigments. The next description is the oil content. In this case, it's average. That tells you how much oil is required in the mixture with this pigment to bind it to that lovely buttery consistency that we love about Harding's paints. Some pigments are simply more thirsty than others and require greater amounts of oil to get them to bind to a nice consistency. The next piece of information is how transparent the pigment is. I'm going to demonstrate that in a moment with several different paints. The drying speed tells you how fast it will dry. This is average. Um, they can vary from just hours to days or even weeks, depending on the pigment itself. It's not really related to the oil content, though you'd think it might be. It's actually the pigments themselves dry at different rates. Some of them are incredibly quick and some much less so. The light fastness tells me the resistance to fading when the pigment is exposed to sunlight. In this case, it's listed excellent. And finally, the tint power tells me how strong this paint will be when I mix it with other paints. That's really important to me and makes a big difference when I'm using colours in making a painting. It really speeds up my ability to accurately match colours if I understand the tint power of the pigments that I'm using. So I'll demonstrate that principle as well in just a moment. So with reference to the opacity, there are four descriptors that we see on the tubes. Any, any paint spread in a very thick layer will appear opaque, but when we spread them out more thinly like this, you can see this is transparent ochre. So obviously in the name it tells you this is going to be completely transparent, so it's glass-like when spread thinly. This information is really important if you want to use these colours for glazing. Um, so if you're going to use a grisaille and then glaze over the top, then you're going to need to know which of the colours are more transparent, which are going to work better for glazing. The next stage up would be semi-transparent. So this raw sienna is described as semi-transparent. So this is maybe 30-40% opaque. So you can see, we can still see through that. Um, it's still got a luminous quality to it. The next one up is an Italian brown ochre, which is described as semi-opaque. So this is probably 70% opaque at this point. So the boundaries on these are not strict, they're just a guideline. 
Um, but you can see that has a flatter appearance to it. I've tried to choose colours that are fairly similar. Um, but you can see this one has a flatter look than the raw sienna. And the last one I've chosen is Naples Yellow, which is completely opaque. And you can see if you spread anything thinly enough, it will acquire some transparent qualities. But really, in its innate form, this is a properly opaque pigment. So that's the difference. Opaque, semi-opaque, semi-transparent, transparent. It's like a scale of four stages. Similarly with tint power, we have high, low and average. So something like this uh, permanent sap green has a high tint power. This is often down to the size of the paint particles. Different pigments behave better when ground to different particle sizes. So there's always an optimum particle size for each pigment. And for this particular one, or the pigments in this, this is a mixture, um, but they like to have a small particle size, which gives them a very strong tint power, very high tint power. This is Terra Vert. This looks better and performs better with a larger particle size. Uh, it's just the nature of it. It has to have a bigger, and it, you can hear it's got a crystalline quality to it. That's always a clue that it's got big particles because you can feel them. Um, so this has a much, much lower tint strength. Now the best way to test it is with white paint. So if I put a little bit of white paint into the Terra Vert, you can see it very quickly turns very white. So the white has a big impact on that colour. If we do the same with the permanent sap green, a small amount of white doesn't have anywhere like the impact. It hasn't lightened the colour anywhere near as much because this is a much stronger colour so it stands up to it much better. If I mix some more in you can see it's really quite strong. So a tiny little bit, if I take a big chunk of white, you can see a tiny bit of this sap green, just a little tiny bit there, will have a big effect on all of that white. So this is a powerful colour, so it has a high tint power. I hope that was helpful.